Dr. Morland, I want to thank you for making time to discuss some questions on the relationship between faith and science for our audience in Albania. Oh, and it is a joy to be with you, and I'm excited to be a part of your program. Thank you. As I mentioned in the introduction, it seems that beside philosophical studies, you also have earned degrees and done research in two other disciplines, science and theology. This is precisely where I wish to begin our conversation. Uh, in some circles today, especially among academics, there seems to be a popular view that science has buried God. According to your findings in both disciplines, do you think this is a correct assessment? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, people who make that assertion are simply ignorant of the facts. Uh, about 95% of science has nothing to do with God or religion. I mean, I don't care if a methane molecule has four hydrogen atoms or 50. It doesn't make any difference to any doctrine that I hold. And um, if they discover uh, that a certain thing uh, helps heart attack patients as opposed to something else, it doesn't matter to me. So 95% of science is just irrelevant. The remaining 5%, I would say 3% of it has been in favor of God's existence. Uh, the discovery that the universe began to exist uh, requires a, a cause outside the universe. Uh, the discovery that the universe is fine-tuned and things like that have all supported theism. Now, the remaining 2%, uh, Kaun, uh, actually is not a problem against the existence of God or the central doctrines of Christianity. The remaining 2% is primarily a difficulty with the reliability of Genesis 1 through 11. And so uh, that's where science is raising difficulties. And I want to say that I believe in the full reliability and inerrancy of Holy Scripture. But I could say to someone, well, look. I will just grant you, for the sake of argument, that Genesis 1 through 11 is allegorical. What does that have to do with whether or not Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the Gospels are historically reliable, and God exists? So uh, we, we need carefully to set the record straight about this. In summary, most of science is irrelevant. About 3% has helped us. And 2% it raises problems with the early chapters of Genesis, but not with the deity of Christ or salvation or anything like that. Well, I had the chance to uh, buy your book, uh, Scientism uh, and Secularism, and I want to congratulate you. It's a fascinating book, uh, very well written. I, I saw that you make a distinction between science and scientism. Uh, would you please explain the difference between them and why this distinction is important? Very, very good question. Um, science refers to a set of disciplines, physics, chemistry, psychology, and, and the kind of uh, methods and practices that they engage in in those fields. So that's science. We all know uh, what it's like for someone in a chemistry lab to do an experiment. Scientism is a very, very dangerous idea that is actually at the foundation cone of the destruction of Western culture. And it is the idea that the only way we can know reality or the vastly superior way to know reality is through the hard sciences. If you can test something in chemistry and physics and neuroscience, then you can know it's true. But if it's not capable of being tested in one of those fields, it's nothing but just blind opinion, blind faith, and uh, expressions of emotion. So what this philosophy does is it says that claims in ethics or religion can be disregarded and not taken seriously 
because no one, no one can know whether those claims are true or not, because the only way you can know whether something's true is if it can be proven in the laboratory in physics and chemistry and science. That means that there is absolutely no knowledge of reality outside the hard sciences. And that conflicts with Christianity, which says that it is providing us knowledge that there is a God, that Christ rose from the dead, that there are moral absolutes and life after death and so on. So that's the basic difference. Dr. Moreland, uh, in one of the chapters of, the, of your book, uh, you claim that scientism in itself is self-refuting. In what sense does scientism defeat itself? Let me tell you a story. I was at a dinner party where I was going to be giving an evangelistic talk. And I was warned that a physicist with a PhD from Johns Hopkins University was going to be there, and he hated Christianity. Well, before the meeting began, I was at the uh, refreshment table, and this gentleman walks in, and he comes up to me and says, excuse me, but I understand that you, uh, you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best shot. And he said, well, I used to be interested in that when I was a teenager. But when I grew up intellectually and matured as a thinker, I realized that if you can't test it and prove it in the laboratory and quantify your data, it's nothing but a bunch of idle opinion and hot air. Well, I let him talk for a few more minutes and he made 20 or 30 assertions. I stopped him and said, I have a problem, sir. Maybe you can help me. Um, you claim that if something can't be proven in the laboratory in chemistry and physics, it's nothing but hot air and idle opinion. He said, yes, that's my view. Well, I said, you've made 20 or 30 assertions, and I can't think of a single one of them that can be tested and proven in physics and chemistry. If I'm wrong, please tell me which statement you made that could be so tested. But do you see my dilemma? If I'm right, then by your own standards, everything you've been saying for the last few minutes is nothing but hot air and idle opinion. And he had absolutely nothing to say to that. Now, something is self-refuting if it makes itself false. Like the statement, there is no sentence of English longer than three words. Is itself longer than three words? The statement, the only way that you, the only thing that can be true and rational is what can be proven in the hard sciences, cannot itself be proven in the hard sciences because it is a philosophical statement in a field called epistemology. And so the statement refutes itself and cannot possibly be true. And Cohn, what I try to do in my book, Scientism and Secularism, is I try to equip the reader to understand how to recognize scientism and respond to it. And I make the book readable so it can be understood by a non-specialist. Great. Uh, so your position seems to be that there are areas of knowledge that uh, lie completely outside the, the competence of science, as you, as you just said. And in other words, there are things that exist in a non spatiotemporal sense, and therefore science cannot help us to know about those things. Now, can you give for our viewers some other examples of this kind of knowledge? Absolutely. Um, logic and mathematics are not capable of being known by science because science actually has to presuppose the truth of logic and mathematics. Uh, science is what's called an a posteriori field, and that just means that science is uh, testable empirically with the senses. But you don't know mathematics and logic that way. These are what are called a priori fields. They're known by the grasp of the intellect, 
without any dependence on the census at all. So logic and mathematics would be an example. Another example would be objective moral values. Science assumes that there are moral absolutes. For example, it assumes that we ought to report our test results honestly and fairly. But you cannot know moral assertions through the scientific method. Do I have a moment to tell you a story about this? May I? Um, I was in the hospital uh, recovering from cancer surgery, and a nurse came in, asked me what I did for a living, and I said, I used to be a physical chemist, but now I'm a theologian and philosopher. And she looked funny at me and said, well, that's odd. And I said to her, I'll bet I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I used to be in a field in chemistry where you could really know the truth, but now I'm in fields where it's just expressions of opinion and feeling and nobody can know the truth. And she said, how did you know that? And I said, well, I've met people like that before. And I said, did you know that there are ethical claims that I know with greater certainty than I know that there are, for example, electrons? And she said, you're kidding me. And I said, no, take, for example, a statement, torturing little babies for the fun of it is wrong. I know that's true. And I cannot imagine in the next 50 years us discovering any new evidence that would make that moral belief suddenly irrational and false. But the statement there are electrons, that the history of the electron has gone through the, the German wave electron, the J.J. Thompson electron, the, um, the uh, ether electron, the Bohr electron, and now the quantum electron. And I said to her, we no longer believe in the Bohr electron or the Thomsonian electron. Now, could you imagine 50 years from now, we will discover things so that we would no longer believe that the electron as we currently understand it exists. And she said, no, that would be quite possible. So if you ask me if I believe in electrons, I'm going to assume you mean the current understanding, and my answer is yes, but I have to admit that it's tentative because it could be overthrown in 50 years. But the ethical statement I just made, torturing little babies for the fun of it, is inconceivable that there would be evidence to show that that's not rational in 50 years. It may be in 50 years people will no longer believe it, but that doesn't mean they've discovered evidence against it. So, Cone, their moral knowledge, um, uh, knowledge of logic and mathematics, uh, knowledge of one's own uh, uh, consciousness through introspection, I could go on and on, but there are a lot of things that we know that can't be proven in the hard sciences. Dr. Moreland, do you think that science and faith are compatible with each other? I don't like to put it that way. The answer is yes, but I don't like the word faith. Because today it has come to mean the blind acceptance of something without any basis. I rather prefer the word, I would rather put the question, are, are scientific truth claims compatible with theological truth claims? If, if we put it that way, then my answer is absolutely yes. Because as I said earlier, there are a number of claims that are being made in science that are providing evidence that God exists. Take, for example, the discovery that living things are composed of information. They're not composed primarily of stuff or of material stuff. What really makes a frog a frog is the information contained in the frog. The problem is that, as is widely acknowledged, information is not physical. It's immaterial. 
So my question is, if you start with the Big Bang, and the history of the world is the history of the rearrangement of chemistry and physics particles, how are you going to get something immaterial popping into existence from mere matter? You can't do that. That's getting something from nothing. And so the best explanation for the origin of immaterial information is a divine mind, because information ultimately dwells in minds. We all know that. So there's just one example of how a theological claim, God exists and is rational, has been confirmed by a scientific claim, living things are composed of immaterial information. And so absolutely, uh, theology and science are compatible. There are a few problems when it comes to the early chapters of Genesis, but there are solutions to those. Uh, and that's my view on it. Now, I want to point out one area that seems controversial uh, on, on this topic. Uh, one of the areas of science that you have spent time researching uh, is neuroscience. And as you know, many neuroscientists have constantly claimed that the human beings do not have a soul. And this seems to be incompatible with the Christian teaching. So how then would you make the case that we humans are more than our brains without violating scientific findings? This is another good question. Um, two years ago, I was invited to deliver a lecture at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. This is the main uh, scientific research center in the United States government and they have thousands of scientists. Well, I went and spoke to a large gathering of uh, research biologists, neuroscientists, and so on. And I made the claim that, that when it comes to discovering how the soul and, and its states of consciousness, like thoughts and memories and beliefs and so on, when it comes to how the soul interacts and depends on the brain and how the brain depends on the soul, neuroscience is wonderful. But when it comes to questions about what is consciousness and what is it that possesses consciousness, neuroscience has absolutely nothing to say about the subject. You know what happened? I got no pushback on that. None of the neuroscientists in that audience had anything to say against my claim, and here's why. I have to get your listeners to first of all understand what it means for two theories to be empirically equivalent. That just means that these two theories imply exactly the same observational data. If that's the case, then you can't appeal to empirical observations to decide which theory is true, because both theories are compatible with the same observation. Now, there are a certain group of neurons in the brain, those are just cells in the brain, where called mirror neurons. And we've discovered that if they're damaged, a person cannot feel empathy. Now, there are three theories that can explain that fact. One of them is physicalism, which says that a feeling of empathy is the same thing as mirror neurons firing. So when mirror neurons can't fire, there's no empathy because they're just the same thing. The second view is called property dualism, and that says, no, no, no. Uh, a, a feeling of empathy is an immaterial state of consciousness that is located in the brain, but to feel empathy, the brain has to be functioning properly. The third theory is, no, no, the feeling of empathy is an immaterial conscious state, you're right about that, but it is possessed by the soul a firing of mirror neurons is a brain state possessed by the brain, but while the soul is in the body, 
there are certain things that it cannot uh, have happen unless the brain is working. And so if mirror neurons won't fire, the soul is unable to produce a feeling of empathy that it contains. Now listen, all three of those theories are compatible with exactly the same neuroscientific empirical data. And so neuroscience cannot tell us which of those three theories is true. To answer the question as to which is true requires philosophy and theology. And in my book I show the best arguments show that consciousness is immaterial and the soul is what possesses consciousness Though just as when I'm in a car and I'm driving around, I depend on the car working. If it breaks down, I can't get somewhere, but that doesn't prove I'm the car. In the same way, while I'm in my body, if my brain breaks down, I can't do certain things in my soul, like feel empathy, but that just shows a dependency relationship, not that consciousness is the same thing as the brain state, or that there's no soul. Neuroscience is silent on the nature of consciousness and the nature of the thing that has it. We're related to the same topic. I'm aware that you also have shown interest exploring what are called near-death experiences, or perhaps, as I've heard you once said, better be called after-death experiences. Do you think they are authentic first? And if so, uh, how do these after-death experiences inform us about the soul and the spiritual world? Well, there's no question that near-death experiences are real. Uh, there are 200 to 300 million that have happened worldwide. In the United States, 12 to 14 million people have had an after-death experience in the last 30 years. Now, these have been researched very carefully by uh, PhD researchers at the University of Connecticut and other major schools, and they have discovered that in many of these experiences, the people come to learn things that they could not have known if it were simply oxygen deprivation to the brain or something else. For example, some people are able to report what was happening two rooms down the hall, and the doctors went and verified what happened, and this is in the medical record. Um, one Dutch cardiologist, Pim von Lommel, uh, said that his research into People who died through a heart attack and were revived 20 or 30 minutes later were able to describe the resuscitation techniques so accurately that they could actually be used to train doctors about how to resuscitate people with a heart attack. But when he studied people who died of a heart attack but did not report a near-death experience, and he asked them to try to explain what happened to resuscitate them, they all got it wrong. They described things they saw on television and things like that. So the proof is that people come to learn things that are now in the medical records and were verified by eyewitnesses that they could not have known if they did not have a real near-death experience. Now, since these things are real, this is a real problem for naturalistic atheists because what it proves is that I am not my body, that I depend upon my body to see and hear while I'm in my body. You break, my eyes are poked out, I can no longer see. But when I'm outside of my body, I can see and hear without a brain or, or eyeballs. What that shows is that life after death is real and, and that I am not my soul. And that is a, I mean, I'm not my body. And that's a real problem. By the way, a book by John Burke 
called Imagine Heaven, shows that that 95% of these near-death experiences are consistent with the Bible. A lot of people think that they're not consistent with the Bible, and he shows that, in fact, they are. There's about 5% that are kind of goofy and, and way out there and are probably not credible, but that these are harmonizable with Scripture. Dr. Marlon, many Christians have found themselves positioned between their desire to appreciate science and their personal commitment to faith in God. In doing so, they have come to a conclusion that for them seems to be a reasonable compromise, namely mixing, for example, the theory of evolution, uh, which they consider scientific, with their Christian faith. And as a result, they now hold the view that is called theistic evolution. Do you find this view compatible with Christianity? Well, I do not. It is compatible with Christianity, if you mean, uh, is it compatible with the claim that Jesus was the Son of God and rose from the dead? So it's compatible with that. But it is not compatible with a person who believes that the Bible is the Word of God and when properly interpreted, it teaches the truth, because you cannot harmonize Genesis 1 through 3 with evolutionary theory. Fortunately, um, there is an alternative called the intelligent design movement, and in my book, I explain why intelligent design theory uh, which shows that allows the existence of God to be a part of an explanation for the origin of life and body plans and so on. I show that that is science, it's not religion, and that I also give reasons for when it's rational to go against the majority of experts in a field. And so even if the majority of experts in biology and so on believe in evolution, it is reasonable to go against them uh, if there are certain criteria that are met, and I explain that in my book. So I believe, uh, Cohn, there's an alternative to theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is not, in my opinion, a way of integrity in harmonizing scripture with science, fortunately, we don't need to do that. There is a strong case for intelligent design, and in my book I have uh, some footnotes that reference books that you can get to, to read about that case. So can you mention uh, what contribution does intelligent design make to this relationship between science and faith? The contribution that intelligent design makes is that it, it, it shows that you don't have to limit yourself to purely naturalistic explanations when you're doing science. That when you're doing science, it is also legitimate, if the data warrant it, to explain some data by appealing to the actions of a personal agent. Consider archaeology. In archaeology, if you discover pottery, you don't have to explain where it came from by erosion and the laws of nature. You explain that pottery by appealing to a personal conscious agent who designed that pottery for a purpose. Now, you can do the same thing in biology if the evidence warrants it. And what the intelligent design movement has done has discovered several phenomena that are in biology that simply cannot be explained by natural law and random mutation but that are easily explained by the action of a powerful, intelligent, designing God. So what this does for Christians is it frees them up to allow data 
in science to be explained by an act of God if the data warrants it. They're not straitjacketed with having to say, well, I know the best explanation would be God's action for, for this phenomenon, but we're not allowed to go there because that would be to abandon science. The ID movement shows that's not true, and I explain why in my book. Now, in the schools throughout the United States, uh, I'm high schools and universities, uh, besides the Christian schools, do you think this intelligent design movement can be an alternative in those schools as an explanation for the origin of life? And is it happening somewhere? The answer is yes and no. Um, yes, there is a growing number of scientists that teach in major secular universities that are joining the intelligent design movement. One example would be Michael Behe, it's spelled B-E-H-E, who has written books like Darwin's Black Box, refuting Darwinism in favor of intelligent design. So yes, there is no doubt that there is a growing number of scientists who are joining the intelligent design movement. But no, I don't think this is going to be widely accepted because if those people are discovered, their colleagues, they will get fired, they will lose their jobs. I have actually, there is, was a, a documentary made about this that was in movie theaters that documented a number of cases where non-tenure track professors at Iowa State and other universities who became intelligent design scientists were denied tenure and fired. Those professors who have tenure are often consigned to having to teach intro classes to biology and they're no longer allowed to teach graduate students. So there's terrible sociological pressure in the science departments to toe the line and to stick with Darwinism. And if you break with that sociology, you become an outcast and you have to keep secret and quiet that you no longer believe in Darwinism in order to keep your job. That's the problem we're facing. It's not the evidence, it's the sociology of science. Dr. Moreland, I want to conclude with uh, one last question. Uh, considering all that we have talked about so far, let us suppose that someone might agree that the real science is not at odds with, uh, with the theological claims, as you put it, uh, but rather that it reveals more and more about the divine creator. Uh, however, we should admit that all this does not prove that the Christian faith that you hold is true. So why should someone choose Christianity? This is a very good question. And again, I believe that people need to know why they believe and not just what they believe. To put it differently, we need to present people with apologetic arguments that Christianity is true. I'll just say in conclusion that there is strong evidence that God exists and there's strong evidence that the New Testament documents are historically reliable and that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, this is not based on faith, it's based on evidence and reason. Uh, Cohn, we have to start presenting to people and training our church members and our young people, the answers to the questions people are asking us. And I say if we do, then we will be presenting a reasonable case. Like First Peter said, always be ready to give an answer when people ask you the reason for why you're a Christian. We need to do that more than we're doing it now. Well, Dr. Moreland, Thank you so much for taking time to discuss these important questions for us today. It has been a delight to talk to you.
It has been a great joy for me too. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you.